Okay, I believe we are on the internet, live on YouTube. I see we already have a, a number of folks here waiting, um, 16 of you or so, and I'm sure that number will continue to grow. It's great to be with you all today. My name is John Lustria. I'm the Director of Research at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Robert Hicks, uh, of uh, the was the director for uh, almost 12 years of the Mütter Museum and the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. Uh, and he's going to be talking with us today about vaccines in the Civil War and uh, smallpox, uh, specifically vaccination against smallpox uh, during the Civil War. So it should be a really, really interesting program. Uh, and I think you're all going to enjoy it. Um, I want to say, of course, if you like our videos, uh, go ahead and hit that like button. I see two of you have already liked the video. We appreciate that. Um, but the more uh, more likes and such we get, the better. That helps us out, lets us know what you enjoy hearing about. And if you always want to stay up to date with all of the, the programming that we're doing, best way to do that is to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which you can do by hitting our, our uh, you know the subscribe button um, just uh, below the video there. And if you wanna take your support just one more level up, you consider becoming a, a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, for as low as $25 a year, you support programming and research like this. Um, so I'll put the link in the comments uh, on how to become a member. So um, all of that helps us out immensely. So with all of that said, and uh, when and I see, I want to shout out the people we already have watching, uh, Maggie from Shiloh, Tennessee, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Swineski from Uniontown, Ohio, Hannah from London, so we're international here, uh, Gary from Ellicott City, Maryland, Hugh from Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, Bowen from Mooresville, um, so got a, a good crew that are already sounding off in the comments here. And I should note, by the way, if anyone has any questions during the program itself, uh, go ahead and drop those in the comments and we'll, we'll get to them if, if, uh, if we can. So thanks for tuning in. And we're gonna go ahead and, and get started here. Um, so Robert uh, has done just a, a ton of research on uh, smallpox and, and um, smallpox vaccination during the Civil War. Uh, and I wonder, you know, if you might get us started off by, you know, what it was exactly that, uh, that drew you to this subject in the first place. Well, for several years, uh, we had at the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia, a, uh, a long-term exhibition called Broken Bodies, Suffering Spirits, and it focused on the medical dimension of the Civil War. In preparing for that, uh, going back 10 years ago, really, uh, began looking at um, an array of health challenges during the Civil War. And I was intrigued by a comment of medical historians that the Civil War was the most significant health crisis the United States has ever faced. Now, right now at this moment in 2021, we've got a challenger, of course, um, COVID. And probably we'd have to say for mortality, the flu pandemic of 1918, the Civil War, and HIV are the three biggest health threats that this country has faced. Now, uh, but proportion to the population, um, the population of the United States during the Civil War was 10 times less than it is now. So if we look at overall numbers, the impact of the mortality of the Civil War, even though we're at those numbers now with COVID, had a bigger impact on the larger society. But I was intrigued about vaccination because there was only one disease that could be vaccinated against at the time, and that was smallpox. I wanted to find out what was the smallpox practice in both armies and what was the smallpox threat during the Civil War, which led me into some very interesting directions. Yeah, uh, so fascinating. And, and also I, I see in the comments, we have someone tuning in from Venezuela. So we're, we're extra uh -huh. international here. Yes. Um, well, yeah, that makes tons of sense. And, and we always love to bring up that perspective here at the museum that the Civil War was indeed, uh, if not the, certainly among the, the greatest uh, health crises that we've ever faced in this country. And it's not one, I think, that we 
often think about, you know, we, we don't often think about it from that perspective. And obviously that's really important for what we do here because we love to connect the past to the present, um, you know, and try and, you know, make, make the past relevant. And, you know, just the knowledge that of course we're, we're dealing with another, you know, health crisis, uh, you know, a global health crisis in this instance, you know, the times we're living through, but just that it might offer some hope that we have gone through other health crises before and that you know hopefully there might be something that uh that we can learn uh from all of that uh and so you know like like what i do you know you came across you you stumbled into almost the research you know through through our career path we're blessed to have you know what, what i think are really interesting uh you know jobs and then we get to research all kinds of really interesting things um now as you were going about kind of starting to put together some of the research. If you want to research smallpox and the Civil War and vaccination and all that sort of thing, where do you go to do that? Well, first of all, uh, let's go to my slides. I've got some slides to illustrate some of what uh, the points that I want to make. Let's go to the first one. All right. That is not the first one. Uh, okay, here we are. Yeah. And, yes, uh, and, and viewers should note, uh, you know, since we are talking about smallpox, there are a couple images that might be a little bit jarring here. So just uh, strap yes. in. Is it possible to put it on slideshow and uh, we can eliminate uh, the background? Perhaps. Perhaps. Okay, I see. All right. There we are. Slideshow. Okay. okay. All right, good. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, to take, let, let's uh, stick with maybe, the first slide for a moment. Yeah, maybe I, I can't do it without having them go through. We'll, we'll just do it like this. Okay, all right, fair enough. Uh, just to take your last point about um, uh, what we can learn from the Civil War, there's still a very ever-present popular image of the Civil War as not only the brutal conflict that it was, but the medical side being equally brutal. Uh, people can imagine amputating limbs right and left uh, no germ theory, no antiseptic procedures, and so on. And this is uh, obviously ever present in cinema and popular uh, literature. But as your museum does so well, medicine during the Civil War is an infinitely more complex subject. And while, yes, uh, the onset of sterilizing tools for surgery, for example, uh, was really not a common practice until after the Civil War, the Civil War was a pivotal moment, and it's worth remembering that, uh, to take the Northern Army for an example, example, not only did physicians have to deal with wounds and injuries and the travails of being on the battlefield, but they were required to conduct research, and tools were made available to Union Army doctors to do just that, such as providing microscopes, translating into English, fresh off the press, works from, say, Germany, on, uh, on cellular tissue, cellular pathology, for example, all uh, pathbreaking, cutting edge medical literature was immediately translated and provided for uh, army doctors. And the South did what it could as well to create a formal structure to keep physicians educated and on the front lines of research. So that said, uh, I wanted to start with this image because the uh, little girl on the right has smallpox. A colleague pointed out that if, uh, COVID had uh, symptoms that looked like this, the vaccination uh, cooperation in society would be near 100%. Now, I wanted to show this picture to just remind people the disease we're talking about and what it looks like. And it can cover the face, get in the mouth, it can blind people, get on uh, arms, upper chest. And for a few weeks, it is sheer misery. Now, uh, that said, to my knowledge, there is no photograph from the American Civil War showing a person suffering smallpox, either a soldier or a civilian. I have not seen one that is securely dated to the Civil War. So any photographs you see in my presentation are post-Civil War, just to illustrate what this looks like. So let's go on to the next slide, since you asked me about sources. Well, the sources I, would, I was looking at in preparation for our exhibit came from a variety of as we call primary source material. On the far left, the Confederate States Medical Journal that uh, the Confederate Surgeon General created. It only ran for about a year during the war, 
uh, before the war ended. But the idea was to have a communication with uh, Confederate doctors in the field and allow them to discuss what they were doing, make their observations, and in some cases record some genuine scientific investigation. In fact, the document in the middle is a circular issued about vaccination, giving instructions for all doctors in the Confederacy, issued by the Confederate Surgeon General. The two volumes you see on the right are two volumes of a much larger work. Uh, the key uh, research source, if I had to point to one, is this massive compilation that was published after the war of everything we learned medically during the war the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. This was published uh, by the US government printing office in the 1870s, 80s, multiple volumes. And it's also a landmark of printing. It has graphs giving data with colored charts. It has chromolithographs, colored illustrations of uh, wartime injuries that were, were painted or drawn. Uh, it has uh, all kinds of empirical based reporting too. And it incorporates uh, a report that I'm gonna talk about a little later uh, that was conducted of Southern surgeons concerning the smallpox pandemic, or I should say epidemic really, that raged throughout the South during the war. Uh, but there's one more source that I found that turned into an interesting investigation in its own right. Next slide. This gentleman, Joseph Jones, trained at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, a young, aggressive, brilliant doctor, but when war happened, there was a grand exodus of Southern medical students from Northern medical schools. And Philadelphia, of course, really was the biggest for that. And these students were brought down to the Confederacy and assigned military roles. And Joseph Jones was one of them. He was an unusual doctor because unlike most doctors who were assigned to regiments or brigades, divisions, uh, to deal directly with soldier patients, Jones didn't have that job. He was sort of a doctor at large on special assignment to investigate specific problems. And one of them was smallpox. At the end of the war, when Richmond burned, that report that he created and other medical records were burned as the Confederates torched the town before the Union troops could arrive. But after the war, when Jones was at the University of Nashville Medical School, he sent out letters to ex-Confederate surgeons. He wanted to get to them while their memories were fresh. And he said, I am trying to redo a report that I created on smallpox and smallpox vaccination and a phenomenon called spurious vaccination. And please write to me and tell me what you remember from what you contributed to the original report. And based on that, he compiled a study, which you see the cover of here. I encountered this absolutely by happenstance in the library of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. I have found this document a riveting read, a very disorganized read, I might point out. Joseph Jones does not know how to synthesize data. He just puts everything in his report, one thing after another. But uh, I realized this is a report that gives me deep insight, not only into the medical situation in the South, but the larger social circumstances of people worried about their health and worried about an epidemic, both soldiers and civilians. And the phenomenon it talked about is something I'm gonna to get to a bit later when you ask me about problems. So uh, I'll leave it to you for the next question. Sure, well, just a, a few comments on that. I mean, that that's uh, seemingly always how it goes. There's always, you know, a serendipitous discovery or something that, you know, you stumble upon. I mean, I, I ask people all the time because I, I think people are curious, you know, whenever people are presenting research, you know, they like to know where, where you got your information from. And just without fail, it, it's almost always people have stumbled across something really fascinating or unexpected, um, exactly uh, as you did here. So I, I just think that's so interesting how that you know, seem, seemingly always happens. Um, and then of course, I, I have to give you a shout out for mentioning the medical and surgical history. It wouldn't be a, a, a Museum of Civil War Medicine event if we didn't mention the medical and surgical history at least once. It's such a great resource. Um, so, you know, we've talked about, you know, where you got your information, how you compiled it, why you got started down this, uh, this rabbit hole in the first place. Um, and we're going to be talking today a lot about, you know, obviously the vaccination procedure, you know, against smallpox. 
what actually happens in this procedure. Today, we got a hypodermic needle. It's pretty straightforward, um, but it was maybe a little less straightforward back then. Um, tell us a bit about that. I'll get us to the next slide. The vaccination procedure uh, had been around for really half a century since uh, Edward Jenner in England was the doctor that recognized a link between cowpox, that is lesions that appeared on cow's udders that looked like smallpox and were communicated to the milkmaids who milked those cows. And they've got this on their hands, developed identical blisters, but when they recovered from this mild disease, those milkmaids were uh, immune from a big serious disease, which was smallpox itself. So Jenner recognized there's a connection there and he thought, well, wait a minute, uh, since this is a minor version of smallpox, apparently, let's take a bit of uh, those pustules that you saw in that photograph, take some of that liquid out, jab it into a healthy person and let them go through that same cow related disease and become immune to smallpox. Hence vaccination was born. And of course the word vaccination is derived from vodka for cow. So there's the connection. By the Civil War, we had uh, the same practice of either cultivating the liquid in those sores, or when those sores mature and dry up, they turn into scabs. The scabs can also be kept and pulverized, mixed with water, and used for vaccine. So what you see on the right is a kit specifically made for a doctor to administer vaccination. The, two, the tools on the left were common everyday cutting tools that would be in every surgeon's toolkit. And even private citizens who might do minor medical uh, repair work on themselves or their families would have these. That big instrument on the upper left is called a fleam. And it's, a, it's like a folding knife. And you can see that there's a pointed sharp bit that's uh, uh, from the, 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 the silver uh, blade or the steel blade that's, that's pulled out of its little pocket. And that's designed actually to uh, dig deep enough to hit a vein for bloodletting. And a tool of that kind called a fleam might have had multiple blades for that purpose. It could be used for vaccination, not ideal. That one just below it is a very thin pointed blade in a little tortoise shell cover that you can just open up and, uh, and, and prick somebody's skin with that point anointed with some of that liquid. But the kit on the right is purpose made for vaccination. Now there are two lancets in this case, and they're very tiny cases. And they look like little flying birds on either side of the case. Uh, the one on the right is an everyday lancet, uh, similar to the colored picture on the left. The other one on the, just to the left of the kit, also on the black and white photo, makes it look like a flying goose. That special neck, that, that narrow neck and then expanding tip is a purpose-made uh, lancet for vaccination purposes. So you could use your ordinary workaday lancet or you could use a special one. But in this kit, it's designed for both the liquid in the pustules and the scabs. In that little kit in the middle, it's a little leather kit. On the bottom, there is sort of an open recess uh, that's a rectangle and inside you can actually see the maker's uh, emblem. Above the kit, there are two glass plates. Those glass plates are identical and they fit into that space one on top of the other. The idea is you could take the lancet and poke a sore in uh, somebody who has the mild version cowpox or the more common term vaccine disease or vaccinia for that mild version of smallpox symptoms. You could pierce the pustule on your lancet, take a glob of that liquid and put it on the glass plate. Add a little water, put the other plate on top of it, mix it around a bit, and you've just made some vaccine for yourself. And then you could anoint the tip of your little lancet there and just jab it into a healthy person. And when I say jab, you're not jabbing it very deep. You're just jabbing it just inside the skin. You don't want to get deep enough to raise blood, for example. Uh, just open the skin and, and let it, the elasticity close it. Now, if you waited and those pustules on your victim mature, they turn into scabs. The scabs fall off. The little tin box you see in the picture at bottom has a sliding lid and you can see in there, there are pieces of smallpox scabs in there, which they called crusts. That tiny little tin nestles into that case just to the right of where those glass plates are. So all that just tucks up nicely in a little kit and a surgeon can carry it around. So a surgeon essentially makes up the vaccine from either taking scabs, pulverizing them, adding some water, making a little muck, 
anoint your lancet and jab somebody. So that's how it was done. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Now to get vaccine to begin with, uh, if you're lucky enough to have a herd of cows next to you where cowpox is present, then you know you can uh, go to those very pustules on the udders and lance them and do what you can do. But there was a pretty thriving business in, in vaccine. And you see here ads from, on the right, a newspaper, a trade newspaper for the chemist world. So if you were in the Union Army, uh, you had a medical purveyor whose job it was, was to buy uh, medicines on an open market and have them redistributed to Union forces, Union surgeons. Vaccine was in sort of a special category all to itself. And uh, some guys, sometimes you had to make application, as you did in the South, directly to the Surgeon General's office to get your vaccine because it was not common and not ever plentiful enough for everybody. So you see different ads here that appeared, and a lot of it hints at imports of vaccine. Remember, of course, the Southern ports are blockaded during the war, so they cannot get vaccine as uh, the Northerners can do. Also, there's no facility in the South, particularly, where it's a center of trying to produce uh, or package vaccine. These ads show different ways of packaging vaccine. There's a put scab in tinfoil, put the lymph, which is the liquid, in little capillary tubes, uh, and then empty them. Uh, the scabs had a larger shelf life, a longer shelf life than did the lymph that's taken and stored away. But here's, you can buy this. Uh, here you have an inset picture in the middle showing a small jab in progress of a later 20th century vaccination needle. Notice it's bifurcated. And sometimes you see them that look like they're little, uh, uh, an assortment of prickly pins designed to just roughen up the skin to get that vaccine in. But I wanna call your attention to the ad in lower left where it says vaccine virus from healthy white children. I will come back to that and the meaning of that a little bit later. But the vaccine in these cases does not always come from cows. It comes from people and the ideal person to propagate it through were healthy children. So uh, there was a doctor in the Confederacy, for example, who had trouble finding vaccine and he kept a, uh, a child within his control who had the lighter version of smallpox symptoms, the vaccine disease or vaccinia, infected at any given moment. So that person was going through about a 20 day cycle that included the appearance of the pustules and eventually the scabs. And then when that, that, that child's disease was running its course, he'd reinfect another child. So there's always a child available to him in order to get vaccine. That sounds pretty bizarre today, but uh, children were a major source of vaccine. And why children? They're young, they're healthy, they haven't grown to adulthood and acquired all the other diseases that are just endemic in urban communities particularly. So uh, the source of the vaccine is part of our problem here and part of uh, what the doctor North or South has to deal with during the Civil War. It's a more critical problem for the Southern physician, how to get vaccine. And it creates big problems for the Confederacy a little later on, as we will see. Um, I think we can go to your next question. Uh, yikes, that's... Uh pretty kind of frightening to think of the, the children constantly, you know, infecting the other children, you know, the, the idea so that there's always some available. I mean, that's, you know, especially to us today is quite shocking. Um, now, the vaccine had been around for quite some time um, by, by the time the Civil War rolled around. Uh, how widely accepted uh, was the smallpox vaccine? Were people pretty gung ho about it? And, and I'm of course asking this. You know, obviously there's uh, quite a bit of hesitancy with the the COVID vaccine today. Was there any sort of parallel uh, in that regard uh, in the, during the Civil War era? Yes, uh, we can go to the next slide. Before uh, addressing some of that specifically about hesitancy, acceptance acceptance of vaccine, and so on just need to highlight a few uh, characteristics of this. It's worth remembering that during the Civil War, it's reckoned by the, uh, by the medical and surgical history that mortality was about 20.5%. We're, we're approaching about 30% here. So one out of every three people who got smallpox 
died of it. That is a high mortality rate. And this is a disease that really frightened people. And in a wartime environment, it frightens military commanders. You do not want your soldiers who are in a very closed community, they're in very intimate proximity to one another, you know, five or seven to a tent, they're sharing things, they're sharing clothes, they're sharing food. And you have, of course, waste disposal issues, human waste, as well as animal waste. You're also in close proximity to animals. And I mention this because horses also have horse pox. We have cow pox, we have horse pox. So smallpox related diseases seem to appear animals to human, animals carrying over to human populations. So if you were both a military commander as well as a medical person, this is something you're pretty worried about. I've got two quotes in here from people at the time, uh, smallpox described as an exemplar of contagiousness and then panic-stricken in Richmond, where Richmond is the capital of the Confederacy, had an early outbreak, and there was a rush to vaccinate every member of the Confederate government bureaucracy. And the physician who accomplished that feat, vaccinating about 1,300 people, sort of mopped his brow at the end of this and said, they all worked except for one that didn't take. So he figured that was a good success rate. But uh, by 1862, it was clear that there was a serious smallpox problem developing in the South. The North did not seem to experience a, 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 a large sort of unified outbreak that could be characterized as an epidemic, but the South did. And by 1863, in every military district of the South, there were smallpox cases. And as you might expect, uh, along major river valleys, these were big vectors of the spread of the disease. And a vector is not a term that they used at the time. Now, uh, given that, um, most people, most educated people were quite happy to go get vaccinated. But there has always been an anti-vax movement. And this goes back even to the origin of vaccination. When George Washington was assigned as commander in chief of the Continental Army, he was dispatched to take command up at Boston where Continental Army forces had besieged a British military who were holed up in Boston. So that city was sort of enveloped by American forces. Uh, the problem was there was a smallpox epidemic raging in the city and uh, Washington did not want to risk contagion with his troops. And I won't go into that, but he managed that situation very, very successfully. He himself had had smallpox and he recognized that people who had had the big disease and survived it were immune for life. So uh, a lot of people knew this. A lot of people knew that this was safe. But even Massachusetts, for a while during the Revolutionary War, had a state law banning vaccination because just too many uncertainties with it. People weren't sure whether to trust it or not. So there was vaccine hesitancy, if we want to give it that term, north and south among the civilian population, among soldiers ditto. But it's worth pointing out that both armies required recruits to be vaccinated. The problem was this was not uniformly observed. It was very casually observed. And particularly if you're a doctor under pressure to certify men suitable to be enlisted, uh, you're gonna do that. And you got a commander leaning on you to make sure you're not screening too many men out for other problems. So they were doing the kind of health checks that you get entering the military now and then some. They were particularly sensitive to uh, noises in the chest that might be tubercular, for example, and knowing that how contagious that was. So if anyone showed up with smallpox, um, they were sidelined. And if smallpox showed up in an army, uh, those people were removed and segregated until they could recover or die. I know I've done more than answer your question here about the armies, but I wanted to give a larger environment for what the sensitivity to this problem was, what the worry was. So you had a very mixed population of some people vaccinated, some people not. Some physicians aggressively pursuing this in their communities, some not. And there's no, we have no data to tell us how many people got it and how many people didn't. We only know that statistically from the Civil War soldiers themselves to the extent that the armies kept those records. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, for example, we have a, a short article on our site. There's, a, you know, one of the more famous units of the Civil War, the 20th Maine. Uh, there's a smallpox outbreak in that unit and they are quarantined, which I believe is why they don't participate in the Battle of Chancellorsville. 
Um, and yes. uh, I'll post the link to that article in the comments if you're interested to check that out. Um, but yes, so there, just, just as you said, there are these kind of, you know, sporadic examples of like, you know, here and there. Um, but, uh, well, that, that's, that's interesting. Uh, Let me and, mention, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Please. Let me mention, since you mentioned Chancellorsville, I've got the Battle of Antietam here. Uh, the big outbreak that the South experienced seemed to begin around the time of that battle. With Lee's army leaving the field, smallpox cases were beginning to happen. By the Battle of Chancellorsville, the Confederate army had to sideline almost 5,000 soldiers due to problems connected with vaccination. We'll talk about the problems in a little bit, but these were vaccinations that not only didn't seem to take, but were introducing other problems into the body. Yeah, and you you already spoke to you know how widely or not widely vaccinated Civil War armies were in that there was a mandate and it was casually followed, but we can't get too much more specific than that. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the ways we can, uh, you know, it's not a holistic way to judge the efficacy of these mandates, but it is a way. Um, you know, were there any kind of notable outbreaks. I mean, you mentioned there were a number of outbreaks in Confederate armies and throughout the Confederacy in 1863. Um, and, and, you know, maybe we'll get to this a, a bit later as well, but I, I believe there is a pretty notable outbreak among the, the, the uh, formerly enslaved population and contraband camps and, and things of that nature. Um, but, you know, maybe talk about any notable outbreaks as a way to perhaps measure how effective these uh, vaccine mandates were or well, how thoroughly they were followed. Uh, it depended on circumstances. And I know a question you're gonna ask me in a little bit has to do with specific problems. Uh, and I'll save most of my juice on that one for, for that question. Uh, but as people began to panic more with the spread of smallpox, not only in the Confederate Army, but of course, you can't retain the virus just within military ranks. It's going to spread to civilian communities. And this happened in the South. Uh, we don't know, we don't have raw numbers of, say, people that were infected, but we know it was serious enough that the Confederate Army had to assign a uh, high priority to figuring this out and getting to the bottom of it and getting and eliminating it. But let me save that for a little bit later. Yes, uh, on that note then, uh, you know, what, what problems could arise with Civil War vaccination? You, you've alluded to it uh, and it's time to, it's time to, to, get, talk to about the, it. get to the good stuff. All right, okay, we'll talk about it. Well, remember that uh, Joseph Jones image earlier and that report that I found about spurious vaccination. That turned out to be the problem. Uh, the, <clears throat> the Confederacy, of course, was a young government trying to establish itself and wage a war at the same time. And uh, the Confederate government quickly realized this is a problem that is quickly getting out of control with vaccination. And uh, did we skip a slide or is this, was this the next one? Uh, it was the, the next slide. Oh, I can okay, good. On one more if you want. No, let's, let's just hold this for a moment. Um, <clears throat> the problem was that uh, soldiers could see what vaccination involved. They could watch a physician doing it. Maybe they'd experience it themselves. But soldiers quickly figured out, well, wait a minute, there's nothing going on here except uh, doctors just sticking a knife in a, in a sore and taking some of the liquid out and jabbing into a healthy person. Well, we can do that. Uh, so soldiers started doing this. They would do soldier, soldier to soldier vaccination. Uh, take out a little knife or bayonet point and prick somebody who may have had uh, uh, maybe manifesting symptoms of, uh, of the, the milder version, the uh, vaccinia, and, and jab a healthy soldier and then pass it on. Uh, and soldiers realized that when the smallpox seemed to happen, or at least the smallpox, smallpox-like symptoms. Um, sometimes other things began to happen too. Um, other sores begin to erupt on the body or strange discolorations took place. And they thought, hey, great, it must be working. You know, the bigger the sore, the better this must be. This was probably not a good attitude to have. And soldiers uh, began to show up to sick call reporting to their doctors with these strange manifestations and doctors were learning, wait a minute, these soldiers are trying to vaccinate themselves and they're causing new problems. Go to the next slide, please. 
So <clears throat> I think uh, I probably covered this territory in talking about vaccination in both armies, but here you have an actual picture of a Confederate physician and a prominent Union physician, both working on the same problem uh, and trying to attack it in different ways. But let's move on. There we go, problems. Um, when I showed you the civilians early next to that ruin, uh, that does have a, a piece of this, this problem that you're seeing on the screen now, and I'll circle back to it. But this is an example. Here you had an instance of this private in the Georgia infantry, and this is not a picture of him. This is a later picture of a smallpox sufferer. But this is somebody who had been vaccinated in both arms. Now, it was not an uncommon practice for somebody to be vaccinated multiple times because in case one vaccination jab didn't take, maybe the one in the other arm did. And if they both, both took, well, all the better for you. So uh, in this case, uh, on the right-hand side, you see an illustration from the period showing a smallpox or vaccinia pustule uh, at approximately day eight or nine in the progress of the disease. And I can tell that simply because there's sort of a circle, a halo around this. And there's a depression in the middle of the pock. This is the pock, hence smallpox. Uh, and it's called an umbilical, umbilicated vesicle in the language of the time. But the photograph you see below it is from the 20th century showing a vaccination site that has gone ulcerated and something wrong. This is the kind of thing that begins showing up on these Confederate soldiers. This is when doctors are learning that do these soldiers are vaccinating themselves uh, and they're spreading diseases. So you figure if you've gone up to somebody with a pustule and taken some liquid out of them and then injected it or stabbed it or jabbed a healthy person to introduce that substance, whatever else was going on in that first soldier's body is gonna transfer to the second soldier. And this is where you begin to see syphilis spreading along with the vaccination results causing many complications. And remember these soldiers at the time that this is all happening are not healthy bodies. They are debilitated, they're fatigued, their immune systems are definitely compromised. So they are ripe for spreading infections. They are ripe for getting infected. Now earlier on a slide, there was a point I did not discuss which was uh, inoculation, variolation, vaccination, these three words and to get them straight within the, the language of the time. If the vaccine uh, derived from a cow, cowpox maybe, or a horse, horsepox maybe, uh, uh, or a human that was going through a mild series of smallpox-like symptoms, you would call that vaccine or vaccine disease. I, I think of it as smallpox light. Same kinds of symptoms, very mild and survivable. The idea was, it's related enough to smallpox, and they thought this at the time, that a piece of the vaccinia would be good to put into the healthy body so they don't get the worst disease smallpox. And of course, that's the principle of vaccination ever since. And uh, uh, major vaccines up until the COVID vaccine, which is a separate case, have been based on this principle. So uh, you see all these terms used in the war, but uh, they're taking both lymph and scabs from people actually infected and recovering from smallpox as well as from the vaccine disease smallpox light. So they're using both sources, as well as anything they get from humans that have contracted either the horsepox or the cowpox. So they say at the time, we only have this from the written records, not from any other data from artifacts. So that's the problem we're running into. And this is getting very, very out of hand in the Confederacy. And they're having so many cases that entire regiments are essentially pulled out of line because of the proliferation of these cases. So this is the problem that has magnified. Go to the next slide, please. Chimborazo Hospital in Richmond. And if you've been to Richmond, uh, there's the main city center. And to the east, there's sort of a dip into a valley near the James River, and then it goes up on a hill. That's Chimborazo Hill. And the largest hospital of the war, north or south, was up there at the time. And you can see this period image, and you can see all the hospital buildings in the difference in the distance. These places were cities in their own right. They required huge staff. They required lots of beds. They required lots of supplies. So there had to be a whole economy supporting this enrichment. This turned out to be the designated hospital for all smallpox or vaccinia sufferers during the war. This got so out of hand in the Confederate Army that the Surgeon General uh, uh, decreed that, look, we've got to gather all these cases in one place, massage them through the system, 
see if they're survivable. And then we're going to track these people by giving them certificates of vaccination, returning them to their, their units if they recover. So they always have a vaccination record with them. This was unusual. Uh, North or South, they did not give soldiers vaccination certificates until this time with the Confederacy trying to work this out. And they really understood contact tracing. And that's one of the reasons for the documentation, isolating cases in a common hospital. So based on this and the cases aggregating here, it gave physicians a chance to, dis to really look at this disease systematically. And the Confederate Surgeon General ended up issuing uh, two orders. And I showed you one earlier about the slide about sources that decreed the only way we're going to get a control on this is to have everybody doing exactly the same thing the same way. He would tell physicians, all right, here's what you do with your left hand. Here's what you do with your right hand. Hold your lancet here. Do this there. Here's how you mix your, your little vaccine on the glass plate. Step-by-step -step instructions, no variance, because it was the opinion of the Surgeon General that the problem we're having here isn't these damn soldiers. It's doctors not being consistent, uniform, not giving vaccinations in the first place. So kick yourselves in the butts, guys, and get your job done. Next slide, please. Because the Confederacy had this very big uh, and almost uncontrollable problem, where did they go to get their vaccine? You can't depend on spontaneous appearance of cowpox in a herd of cows to do it for you. Uh, you have to get it from human sources. Remember the surgeon who kept a child in Tennessee at all times manifesting vaccine disease or vaccinia. Well, the Confederacy sent around terms of doc, uh, teams of doctors to go around to plantations. Why plantations? They're isolated, they're rural. Since they're not in cities, they would not be in that general milieu of endemic diseases that people growing up in cities just happen to get. So what ideal subjects for propagating your vaccine manifestations, your pustules and your scabs are kids. So they went around uh, vaccinating uh, kids, both white and black, healthy white and black children on plantations. And they would come back two weeks later to see which ones had erupted in the sores so they could then harvest those sores for the lymph, the liquid, or for the scabs. And they would do this repeatedly. This is a great untold story of the Civil War. And I found this out by reading Joseph Jones's reconstructed monograph. I had no idea I'd never seen a reference to this happening. And just imagine all those Confederate soldiers, among other things, fighting for a social order in the South that has slavery. How many of those white Confederate soldiers might have reacted weirdly if they knew that their smallpox vaccine came from a black child? And yet that's exactly what happened. Uh, there was interest, as you see here from this ad, in administering specifically to uh, uh, Black people in the South. The fact that there was a Negro hospital uh, has to be interpreted in multiple ways. It's just not a benevolent idea, of, let's take care of our Black folk. It's we need to understand what's operating with, with Black people because they could infect white people. And white people can infect Black people. And what's the difference? And Black people are a labor supply and we need them. So uh, we need to get to the bottom of things. So even into black populations, the spurious phenomenon could, uh, could spill out and hence Negro hospital. So there's it, the big problem. Yeah, it, it's fascinating the ways that, you know, something as cold and, um, you know, uh, uncaring and uh, unbiased as, you know, a disease um, can really sort of lay bare the absurdity of you know certain social orders you know and especially you know racially biased orders uh, you know just it, it just makes it not not a factor uh, and then you know people can then do with that information what they will uh, but it, it's it, it's such an interesting kind of lens to to look at this through and it's fascinating to see how those in the south uh, you know process that information. Um, as we're kind of, you know, winding down here. Uh, I'm, I'm towards the end of my questions here. I'm sure you probably ha have more to say, but uh, either continue in, in this vein or, or take us, you know, where we haven't been yet. Um, obviously, there's a host of things to cover here, but um, yeah, uh, you know, keep going, you know, wherever it is you, you want to keep going. There is one, one phase of this I wanted to, to go through, and it's, it's, it, it builds upon this problem about spurious vaccination and the questions that come up. 
uh, looking at this as, as an historian, um, there are a lot of scientific questions embedded in this and the answers we just have not been having from any sources. It's worth knowing that we've got all these records. The medical and surgical history talks about vaccination. It recounts the Southern experience in more summary form than Joseph Jones reported. Uh, and uh, uh, Joseph Jones continued after the war to investigate this problem because New Orleans had a severe uh, smallpox outbreak in the six months following the conclusion of the war. So even with, you know, the, in, the, in the midst of wartime destruction, the difficulty of recovering a Southern economy, boom, they're smacked with this disease all over again. So, and people in the North, at least the medical uh, uh, people, both in the army and the civilian world, are keeping an eye on this because you can't contain viruses, they can spread North. But for some reason, the North just didn't get it as bad. But the big scientific questions are, what exactly did they use for vaccine? What exactly is this cowpox? What exactly is this horsepox? How's the crossover happen? And really, what's the origin of the vaccines that are used? And this vaccine uh, called or vaccinia disease or vaccine disease that I refer to as smallpox light seems to be like smallpox, have similar symptoms, but it doesn't kill people. It's clearly related in some way, but how? The scientific uh, end of this is nobody knows the answers to these questions. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control has never handled a physical sample of a disease that dates before the 1940s. And we haven't had uh, like leftover smallpox vaccine from the Civil War to examine in a laboratory to figure out what's what. So we've had a bit of a breakthrough in the last few years, and I'm pleased to say the Mütter Museum has been at the center of this. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, to give you this statement. Uh, our friend Joseph Jones, despite all the problems in the Confederacy, ended his report with a bit of uplift. And he said this, vaccination without the spurious phenomena is still the thing, the greatest boon. And he says in that very report, he could imagine a day when smallpox would be wiped away from the planet. And when I read that, I got a little tingle down my spine because I had the opportunity to interview a Dr. D.A. Henderson several years ago in Baltimore. He's no longer living, but he led the team that eradicated smallpox from the planet. And uh, I was just in awe of anybody who can claim on a resume, you know, eliminated a major world disease. And he talked about those last few cases. So Joseph Jones's Confederate ver uh, ideal for the elimination of, of smallpox through vaccine actually did happen. This image on the left is from Jones's period showing a person clearly suffering. Uh, the person on the right uh, is clearly not, I would say clearly not a Civil War photograph. Uh, they did not start recruiting tattooed women at the end of the war as the last ditch defense of the Confederacy. This was a publicity photo from the 1940s showing a circus performer getting vaccinated publicly to encourage other people to do the same thing. But go on to the next slide. This is where we get to some interesting territory with artifacts. When you ask me about sources for talking about the uh, Civil War exhibit we did, a parallel story began to develop aside from preparing an exhibit. And this takes us to next slide. Now, this picture looks a little hairy here in the upper left showing people with face gear and, and uh, there I am with a lab coat holding a box. And you see in color, one of those kits that I showed you earlier in the color image of the very kit that I did show you earlier. Uh, while showing uh, a new employee, uh, a drawer of tools that I always like to show off for the bottom, bloodletting tools, uh, my new colleague pointed to one of these little cases and said, that looks interesting, what is it? Pulled it out and I realized, because I've been researching this spurious vaccination thing, it was a vaccination kit. And I went through the drawer, ended up finding five of them. So they were all Civil War era. These were all kits that were made, customized for specific surgeons. They were not sold as is. And they ended up in the Mütter Museum collection. Now the Mütter Museum has a lot of old medical tools. And this was an era, Civil War, when you, you didn't sterilize tools. So the question remains, could there still be some residue of the vaccination material in these toolkits. And uh, I thought to myself, oh, I wonder if these little tin boxes with the sliding uh, covers, 
still have scabs in them. And I opened them up and sure enough, they do. So I took a deep breath. I've been following this problem uh, where material like this has surfaced in museum collections over the last 12, 13 years. And there've only been a, a handful of them. Now, the thing is, is this gonna start a new smallpox epidemic? The infection risk is likely to be extremely low, but it's not zero. That's the best answer to that, it is not zero. Nevertheless, you find something like this in a collection, you gotta do something about it. So uh, I was on the phone with the Department of Health, the, uh, uh, the CDC, uh, they were talking over my head, gee, should we quarantine, ro quarantine Robert today and you know, keep an eye on him? They finally just said to me and said, nah, just, if you get some symptoms, just let us know. Well, I'm still waiting for those symptoms. Fortunately, they haven't happened. But um, we had already worked with uh, McMaster University in Canada, which has an ancient DNA research center. A few years before, we had, uh, I should say, entertained them. They came to us wanting examples of cholera specimens in order to reconstruct essentially a DNA map of cholera over the last 200 years. Cholera is still alive and well in the world today. There are multiple strains of cholera. And of the specimens they examined, one of them was taken from a man who died of cholera in 1849. And a section of his innards had been preserved in a bottle that showed lesions of cholera. And that since 1849, that jar had never been opened. Our friends from McMaster opened it and they were able to secure a breakthrough that got on the front page of the New York Times. They were actually able to reconstruct the DNA of the cholera in an, that came from the body of an African-American man who died of smallpox in 1849, Philadelphia. First time somebody had done that with a pickled specimen. So the ancient DNA center has been in the forefront of, of innovating methods of assaying early DNA from sources nobody even thought were possible to use. And in particular, they've uh, uh, invented a method of mildly washing early artifacts, the ones you can't sterilize, to see what comes off of them. Next, please. Uh, this gentleman is the head of the Ancient DNA Center. Uh, they've done some, a lot of work connected with smallpox and other diseases that have been very newsworthy, including a paper published last year about the analysis of those very kits. The analysis of those kits in our collection showed uh, three of them came from women of European ancestry living in the Philadelphia area. But the thing that was, is the real challenge for me is there's smallpox. There's the target evil disease at the, at the middle of this thing with its 30% mortality. And on either side of it, there's a spread of similar viruses on a continuum. Today, we call it orthopox viruses. And for vaccination purposes, how far can you go along that spectrum away from your target and extract something that is useful to keep you from getting the target disease? The answer is we don't know because we haven't had this material from the 19th century to look at until now. So we've had a real breakthrough. This is transforming a collection of organs in jars into a bio repository where we now have 19th century specimens, early 20th century specimens that can tell you things scientifically that illuminate history. And that's what's happening to these Civil War specimens and give us a glimpse of what's going on with smallpox and vaccine together. How are they evolving and informing one another? And incidentally, the material that showed up in our kits bears no resemblance to any smallpox vaccine used in the 20th century. So they found something in the 19th century they thought was effective but we wanna know why, what was that substance? How did they use it? What's the character of smallpox at that time and how has smallpox evolved? Those questions apply to the flu, the flu pandemic of 1918, flu is still with us. When you get a flu vaccination today, that vaccine has a genetic lineage that goes all the way back to 1918 to the big one. And when you get a jab for a flu today, it's based on a presumption of what flu virus is going to be the real threat this season out of a spectrum, just like with coronavirus as a spectrum, just like with pox. So we are in really fruitful investigative territory now that combines history with science. And we're expanding this work to look at tools and other materials and other collections. It doesn't have to be limited to a specimen in a jar because these folks at McMaster can look at tools. So it's a good thing that museums don't clean their tools before they put them in storage. Sometimes it's a very good idea not to clean them. 
<laughs> there you go. There's your unexpected takeaway for the day. Um, there is some <laughs> utility in not cleaning old things. Um, but some old clean old things. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, wow, that well, and it gives a, a whole new meaning to the uh, the expression "hope through history," um, you know, which we we espouse quite a bit here um, uh, at the museum. That's a, an incredible, uh, incredible epilogue um, to well, a pretty incredible, uh, incredible story. Um, really, really amazing stuff, and um, you know, it demonstrates that there's you know, so much more room to continue to grow in, in this area, especially as, you know, vaccines are, you know, more and more in the, in the discourse today. So we, we, we brought you back to the 1800s, but like we often do here, we, we wound up back up in, in the present day. There's, there's so much connection uh, between the, the then and now. Um, and that's why, uh, you know, I love doing these, these sort of programs. And, and I suspect it's probably um, something that you enjoy as well. Is that right, Robert? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You might want to move on. I think there's one more slide. Yes. Yes. If, if people uh, really want to pursue the spurious vaccination thing, I, I have a paper about it that's in this book here uh, that came out in 2018. It's an edited volume on the material culture of the Civil War. An, an aspect that we rarely look at. And I would say the analysis of Civil War vaccination kits is square on material culture and it can lead us into some really interesting directions. And by the way, that's not a severed arm. That's a wax arm showing smallpox that's in the Mütter Museum collection. And some of these specimens that are really wax are very, very lifelike and represent a high degree of artistry that is not practiced much anymore. Absolutely. We, we here at the Museum of Civil War Medicine, we have uh, a, a similar wax specimen for a, a gangrenous arm. Um, so if you come to the museum, you can see uh, um, something in that regard. And uh, if you want to pick up a copy of War Matters, uh, we have it for sale at our bookshop here. So uh, you can do all that in one fell swoop. Um, the museum here is open in Frederick, uh, Thursdays through Sundays for walk-ins, and you can make a reservation um, if you want to come uh, Monday through Wednesday. Uh, well, Robert, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Uh, this was a really engaging and fascinating program, and I think the people out there enjoyed it as well. I, I may have scared the bejesus out of people, but hey, we got COVID outside, so what, what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and so as we, uh, we come to a close here, I'll say to everyone, thank you so much for watching and tuning in. Um, it's always great to have you following along with us. Um, if you like the video, go ahead and hit that like button. That's uh, something for free that uh, anyone can do. I see we've got 21 people have already liked the video. Um, I have a few more of you do that. I, we'd appreciate it. Uh, and if you want to stay up to date with all of our latest video programming, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can do that. You can click our logo in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. You get notified every time we uh, do a live stream or post a video. Uh, we have something that goes up at least once a week. So that's the best way to stay up to date with us. And if you want to take your support to the next level, consider becoming a, a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, your membership uh, helps support programming like this. So again, thank you. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, we'll catch you next time. So have a great Thanks day, everybody. everybody. Thanks to everybody. And, and thank you, John.